Hello to all the followers of The Crime Library. Welcome to another exciting episode of our channel, where we explore the darkest corners of criminal history. Today, we're going to dive into the life and crimes of one of the most infamous serial killers of all time, Charles Frederick Albright. Get ready to delve into a disturbing story full of mystery. Charles Frederick Albright, born August 10, 1933, earned a place in history as the Dallas Eye Killer. As we uncover the details of his life and his gruesome crimes, we will delve into the recesses of his twisted mind and explore the motives behind his atrocities. Albright, raised in Texas, United States, appeared to be an ordinary individual, but behind his inoffensive appearance lurked a mind obsessed with power and control. As we delve into his past, we'll look at the events and circumstances that may have shaped his penchant for the dark side of life. From the moment Albright committed his first murder until he was finally captured, we'll dive into the chilling details of his methods, his victims, and the forensic evidence that ultimately led him to face justice. Join us in this suspenseful episode as we unravel the hidden secrets behind the crimes of Charles Frederick Albright. Get ready for a shocking journey through the mind of a serial killer, where we will discover how obsession and violence intertwine in a twisted plot. I assure you that this episode of The Crime Library will leave you breathless. Without further ado, join us in the dark history of Charles Frederick Albright. Charles, August 10, 1933, was adopted by Del and Fred Albright when he was a child. His adoptive mother, a school teacher, was very strict and overprotective of him, so much so that she accelerated her education and made him go two courses ahead of her. However, it is known that she sometimes dressed him as a child and gave him dolls to play with, and that she forced him to change his clothes several times a day so that he would always be clean. One day, Charles told his mother that he wanted to be a taxidermist when he grew up, so she helped him and taught him how to stuff and stuff the animals he hunted. However, the glass eyes used by taxidermists were very expensive, and the boy had to use buttons as substitutes. When he was 13, Charles was arrested for assault with violence and robbery, and at 15, he graduated from high school and enrolled, with forged documents, at North Texas State University. His first conviction would come a year later, when he was caught with stolen money and in possession of two pistols and a rifle, 12 months in prison. Upon his release, he studied at the University of Arkansas State Teacher, specializing in pre-medical studies. But he was expelled, not prosecuted, before graduation for stealing items from campus. Without a care in the world, he forged his notes, stole the proper documents, forged signatures, and gave himself a college degree. He later married his college sweetheart and they had a daughter. Unfortunately, Charles could not hold a job for long. Yet he continued to cheat by obtaining and presenting false high school teaching credentials. But caught in his own deception, he always had to manage to get paroled as a result of his illegal acts. Shortly after this episode, Albright was sentenced to two years in jail for stealing hundreds of dollars worth of merchandise from a hardware store, but he only served six months. In 1981, after the death of his mother, he sexually abused the nine-year-old daughter of some friends. He was denounced again and prosecuted. He pleaded guilty and received direct probation, although he later claimed that he was innocent and had incriminated himself to avoid unnecessary embarrassment. In 1985, in Arkansas, Albright began a relationship with a woman named Dixie, and before long they moved in together. He tried to work as a hairdresser, a carpenter, a baseball bat designer, a carpet installer, etc. But nothing worked enough for him, so most of the time it was Dixie who had to pay all the bills and, on top of her, give him moral encouragement. Her wife had no idea, not the slightest suspicion, what her husband was really doing. On December 13, 1990, the body of Mary Lou Pratt, a 35-year-old prostitute, was found out in the open, face up, wearing only a t-shirt. She had been shot in the back of the head with a .44 caliber bullet and both eyes had been carefully removed, leaving hardly any marks on her eyelids. Apparently the killer had taken them. On February 10, 1991, Susan Peterson, another prostitute, was found nearly naked, wearing only her t-shirt. 
She had been shot three times, once in the top of the head, once in the left chest, and once at point-blank range in the back of the head. A bullet had pierced her heart and another had deposited itself in her brain. A lock of her hair had been placed on top of her chest, and her eyes had also been surgically removed. On March 18, 1991, the naked body of Shirley Williams, a part-time prostitute, was found lying in a lateral decubitus position, on her side, near a school. Her eyes had been delicately gouged out and she had facial bruises and a broken nose. Her cause of death was the shot she had received to the top of the head and her face. With the analysis of the scenes and the victimology, the criminal profile that was being sought was that of a white man, between 30 and 50 years old, muscular enough to be able to move the corpses, and with notions of medicine or ocular biological sciences. And luckily, someone fit this description perfectly. The police only had to connect a few loose ends based on the testimonies they had received and especially that of a specific witness, a prostitute who managed to save herself from her after Charles Albright sprayed tear gas in her face when she tried to attack her. At 10 p.m. on March 22, 1991, members of the police's elite tactical squad showed up at the home of Charles Albright. They broke the windows and threw smoke grenades inside, they broke down the door and dragged Albright and his wife out of bed. They had caught the killer. Charles Frederick Albright lived just two blocks from where the bodies were found, and he never bothered to dispose of the clothing and items used in the murders. In addition, several weapons of various calibers were found in his house, another of his passions. His motivation, a personal crusade, was based on the hatred he felt towards women and, especially, those who were engaged in prostitution, profession that his mother had to practice due to the economic precariousness they suffered. The trial began on December 13, 1991, and Albright was sentenced to serve life in prison. He is currently with the Clements Unit of the Texas Department of Corrections in Amarillo. He collects eyeball cutouts and has his cell decorated with drawings of eyes he did himself. Charles Albright, the Texas Eyeball Killer January 28, 2013 Within the wide spectrum of serial killers captured in the United States, the case of Charles Albright draws enormous attention. He may not have been the most charismatic or prolific serial killer in the North Country, compared to true celebrities of violent crime such as Ted Bundy, Henry Lee Lucas or Charles Manson, but within the world of criminology, his case was studied by various specialists. The reason? Albright's crimes were truly disturbing. North Oak Cliff, Dallas, Texas. On December 13, 1990, some children find the battered half-naked corpse of a prostitute named Mary Lou Pratt, between 33 and 35 years old. The woman had been killed with a shot to the back of the head and there were no witnesses to the events. In the United States, it is not difficult to come across this type of crime, since prostitutes, by working outside the law and venturing into dangerous neighborhoods, run the risk of falling into the hands of unscrupulous men who could, eventually, abuse them, rob them or even kill them if they resist. The policemen assumed that this could correspond to a money problem with a client and they took the body to carry out the usual autopsy. So far, it was one of many crimes. Dr. Elizabeth Peacock received the body of Mary Lou Pratt and prepared to check the condition of her eyes, but when touching one of her eyelids, she noticed that something was not right. Opening it, she discovered the absence of one of the eyeballs. Surprised, she continued inspecting her corpse, and when she opened her eyelids on the other side, she only found blood and muscles, but no eye. The police paid a lot of attention to this crime since the delicacy with which the eyeballs had been extracted denoted expertise in this type of operation. Everything indicated that this would not be the only corpse with empty eye sockets. They immediately contacted the VICAP, an FBI unit that is designed to deal with this type of criminal, violent criminals apprehension program. The experts warned that this type of murderer was the most dangerous, since they are cold-blooded and highly calculating. The fact that he took both eyes from his victim could be a simple hobby or the desire to acquire a trophy, as many serial killers tend to do, in order to relive their crimes and stimulate themselves sexually. 
This is how they usually steal identifications, photos, underwear, and even pieces of the body from their victims, but extracting an eye is not so easy. Susan Beth Peterson was a well-known 27-year-old prostitute, who was found very close to the scene of the first crime. She was half-naked, with a shot to the left breast, above the head, and the last one to her neck, her eyes had also been gouged out. Only two months had elapsed since the first murder, and the police had forbidden any leaks regarding the details of the first crime, in the hope that the killer would leave behind more evidence. With the appearance of Susan's body, and the surgical removal of her eyes, the thesis of a possible serial killer on the loose was unquestionable. The forensic doctors considered the murderer a person with undoubted knowledge in the detachment of eyeballs, since the corpses had no signs of external injuries on the eyelids, only the necessary cut to remove the eyes from their place and for which notions must be had. Of anatomy. Even so, this operation is extremely rare. The police tried to record every suspicious encounter between prostitutes and clients, but nothing out of the ordinary happened. Although within the reports there were a couple of arguments and confrontations, prostitution is such a risky lifestyle that the officers can do little or nothing about it. There was already talk of the existence of the Dallas Ripper, however, not many details were known about the profile of the murderer or his unusual ritual. When a third body turned up, the FBI was trying to profile the man they were looking for. Shirley Elizabeth Williams, had died exactly the same as the two previous women and her eyes had been gouged out. The gloomy mutilations would not be the only clue that the Dallas police would have by then. They found such an obvious link, it focused them on only one place to look for her killer. The three murdered women provided sexual services in the same motel complex, which would indicate that the killer must have worked and lived nearby, however, there was a detail that made the investigations ambiguous. Shirley Williams, 41, was black. In general, serial killers choose victims of the same race or color, therefore, the thesis that the Dallas Ripper was white was handled. There are few cases of serial murder where the perpetrator chooses people of other races. Famous is the case of Jeffrey Dahmer, a white man who murdered several black and Hispanic homosexual boys, leaving the convention of the typical serial killer. After the Shirley Williams murder, the case seemed to get a little more confusing. The woman was lying on the floor, near a school. Two shots had taken her life, one to her face and the other to the top of her head. She also had bruises on her face and a broken nose, but also, although her eyes had been successfully extracted, the assassin committed several lacerations on her face, which showed that she was acting with more brutality. The criminologists, forensics, and criminalists, analyzed the photos of the crime scenes and the bodies, especially the detail of the extraction of the eyes, and agreed that the perpetrator of the crime had a lot of experience, and that he was a murderer in series in a more advanced and mature phase. They profiled him between 30 and 50 years of age at least, in addition to being almost sure that he had already murdered before. The FBI drew up a profile of him, and immediately the police began looking for a physically fit, middle-aged man with advanced knowledge of anatomy, especially with regard to the eye muscles. At that time, rumors of an eye collector murderer anguished Dallas prostitutes and the entire community in general. The discovery of pubic hair on Shirley's neck was scrutinized and identified as that of a Caucasian male. It wasn't much, but there were no more clues. Among the reports, which gradually accumulated, appeared an account of two attacks carried out near the murderer's hunting area. In both, the women had described a muscular assailant, gray hair, who was driving a pickup truck with a roof, colored white and red, or white and brown. A perceptive investigator found a complaint about a guy who harassed a woman who worked as a salesperson in a mall very curious. The man, identified as Charles Albright, would have been harassing her and giving gifts, until the staff of the place had to expel him. Albright had a long police record, including problems with minors. Suspicions intensified when the prostitutes who reported the attacks to the FBI recognized Albright's photos as his attacker. They arrived at the home of Charles, a respectable man in the community, and took him away to the angry complaints of his wife, Dixie. Albright, 57, 
was a very attentive carpet installer and delivery man, knowing the area well from his constant travels. His neighbors were very surprised to see the police knocking on his door, and even more when he was indicated as the number one suspect of being the, at that time nicknamed, Dallas Ripper, or Dallas Slasher. Charles denied everything, however the evidence began to mount against him. The FBI had their man. Coach of a football team, pianist, cartoonist, helper in the scouts, cultivated in the arts, science teacher, and helpful neighbor. When the police entered his house, they were surprised by a huge collection of mysterious masks that Albright owned, which instead of hanging on the walls, were on a table, facing the sky. But they also found a collection of dolls, books on serial killers, texts that talked about the Nazi doctrine and various weapons of different calibers, however, none corresponded to what the police were looking for. A series of precision knives, called Exacto, with interchangeable blades, were also found, with which Albright would have carried out the extractions of the eyeballs of his victims. Charles was arrested without a word. Other incriminating evidence was the different hairs found in a vacuum cleaner with which Albright cleaned his station wagon, although hair and pubic hair from the three murdered women were also found in the vehicle, and his own hair, found on the corpses, which linked him to the crimes unquestionably. Details of the crimes were eventually leaked to the press, and the nickname, Eyeball Killer, began appearing on the front pages of newspapers alongside Albright's photo, shocking the community. This man with an athletic body, soft voice and affable demeanor was born on August 10, 1933 in Amarillo, Texas. He was adopted by Fred and Del Albright. He was a restless and impulsive boy who liked to play in his backyard, performing all kinds of torture and experiments with insects and small animals. During his teenage years, he shoots rubber pellets at squirrels and rabbits, but he was considered a good student at school. Since he was little he had wanted to be a taxidermist, and his mother helped him in his pursuit, however, the economic situation was not very good, and since imitations of animal eyes were too expensive, they could only put buttons in the eye sockets of the birds that he stuffed. A chilling detail indeed. By the time Charles was 16, he had already been involved in many troubles, including mugging and being involved with a local prostitute. At the age of 19, his mother discovers some photos that Albright was jealously guarding from an ex-girlfriend. The image was missing the eyes, which had been cut out and pasted on one of the walls. Digging deeper, he came across hundreds of photos cropped the same way, eyes superimposed on different faces, sloppy pasted together. A preview of what was brewing in the dark world of Charles. At the age of 20, he married Betty Nestor, a school teacher, but he has big problems trying to have a stable job, for which he would soon have some discussions with his wife, who noticed that Charles could not stay in a job for more than three months. Adding to his inconsistent personality was his inability to stay out of trouble. During his married life, he even spent time in jail for falsifying documents, without adding other charges and fines for other types of minor crimes, he tampered with documents, granting himself academic degrees, Albright constantly draws eyes. Which he saves and pastes in some places in your house. Finally Betty separates from him, tired of his strange behavior, especially because of Charles's obsession with eyes and blades. In 1981, he is accused of trying to abuse a nine-year-old girl, a fact that he flatly denies, alleging a misinterpretation of her events, although he accepts that he was joking with her and promises not to do it again. The jury believes him and walks out of the prosecution without any problems. Albright regularly visits his daughter with Betty Nestor, but he seems somewhat distracted. That same year, 1987, a Dallas prostitute is found dead. The woman had not been mutilated like Albright's subsequent victims, but according to several specialists, this she could have been the first of many other unrecognized victims of the mysterious eyeball killer. In 1990, Albright became interested in books on serial killers and began to paint pictures of mutilated women. At the same time, she maintains a sentimental relationship, she, however, does not stop visiting prostitutes to have nights of sex without commitment. It is in this period when the macabre murders begin. More than one of the people who knew him, he said he had heard him cursing the prostitutes. 
He even came to promise to kill some, however, he frequented them behind the back of his partner. His way of killing was cold. He would take a prostitute, have sex with her, and then kill her behind her back. He carried the body a few meters, he was in great physical condition, and did the operation that became his personal brand. He did not take more than a minute to remove each eye, as he was an expert surgeon. After that, he ran away. But not far. In fact, he lived just a couple of blocks from the site of the finds. Albright did not make much effort to hide or mislead the police, until the day of his arrest in 1991. The police were gratified by the killer's arrest, and the FBI surprised by Albright's surgical precision, as the evidence mounted to finally bring down the killer. They found several lint particles on the dead bodies and inside Charles's truck, linking him to the three girls, as well as finding lint in his vacuum cleaner. This, added to the statements of a couple of prostitutes mistreated by Charles in some violent encounters, ended up unmasking the terrible murderer. But Albright continued to deny his participation in the events, until the judge sentenced him to life imprisonment in view of the evidence. To this day, Charles Albright has remained silent and makes no reference to the crimes. He, too, has not wanted to tell psychologists and researchers the reason for the strange mutilations, nor has he said what he did with the eyes that he removed with surgical precision, since they were never found. Investigators continue to struggle to learn his motivations, but Charles only draws, being uncooperative and somewhat alienated. Albright has covered his cell with hundreds of drawings and cutouts of eyes of different colors, shapes, and sizes, however he continues to maintain that he is innocent. Inside the prison compound, Albright arouses tremendous curiosity in the other inmates due to his strange crimes and many prefer to avoid his company.